Praise the Lord. It's so good to be with you tonight. It feels good to worship the Lord. I'm going to read to you from 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, where the apostle writes to Timothy, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto them also that love his appearing. The first words of this chapter are, I charge thee. It is the Apostle Paul giving instruction to a younger minister of the gospel named Timothy. The charge given to Timothy began with reminding him of the imminent judgment. Paul was instructing Timothy that his practices and patterns should be lived with the end in mind. Not only was he to preach the word, but it was imperative that when he did so, it was with the right attitude and in the proper manner. Not all people, according to Paul, would respond correctly to Timothy's preaching, but Timothy was always to keep the right spirit and preach the word. Timothy because of the imminent judgment of God, would need to be wise, he would need to endure afflictions, he would need to work hard at sharing the gospel and fulfill the ministry in every way because there would be that judgment. The apostle then relates his own experience. First of all, he said, the time of my departure is at hand. Now, he was not catching the next flight out but he was about to be executed. This was among his last statements and the last known writing of the Apostle Paul before his execution. The time of my departure is at hand. Then he sums up his journey with God. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He then spoke of the end. The whole reason for fighting the fight, running the race, and keeping the faith comes down to henceforth. Henceforth. Some actually translate this word as finally. All his ministry, all his affliction, all of his work, and now Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. The fighter endures the training, conditioning, and the bout for a crown. The runner conditions, diets, prepares mentally, runs the hard race for a crown. Keeping the faith is all about the crown. Some purport that being a disciple of Christ creates some kind of utopia, heaven on earth type of life. But that's not what Paul told Timothy to expect. That is not what Paul himself had experienced. In fact, none of the 12 that Jesus chose experienced anything close to heaven on earth. In fact, Jesus himself did not experience heaven on earth. Tradition says that all of the 12 were martyred except for the Apostle John, and John suffered and was banished on the
the Isle of Patmos as you can read about in the book of Revelation. So why surrender to Jesus Christ? Why turn from sin? Why live holy, righteous, and godly in this present world? Let me tell you what. It's all about the crown. In Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he told of two ways. One was a broad way, and the other was a narrow way. The broad way appropriately had a wide gate. The narrow way had a narrow gate. There would be those in that day that lived in Bible lands that certainly would have understood the terminology and it would have been clearly plain because every city would have had a real wide gate or the main great gate. But there would be also very narrow gates. We will find out that later we're going to talk about a, a parable that Jesus told where he refers to the eye of a needle, which was a very narrow, small gate in the city. They were used to wide gates that no one could miss, but also it was quite common that there would be a narrow gate that unless you were looking for it, you would never find it. This parable that Jesus told uh, of the broad gate also quite in the mind of those who lived in that day and in that city that the broad way, the broad gate would have many travelers pass through it. But the narrow way had few travelers that would go through it. In fact, even few even found that narrow gate because it was so easy to miss. Most choose the broad way because it's the easiest to see, enter, and walk. But at the end, Jesus said in his parable, there was destruction. The narrow gate, on the other hand, was hard to find, difficult to enter, and one must watch every step they take on the narrow path, lest they stumble. But the end, Jesus said, is life. The narrow way is a picture of living for and walking with Jesus Christ. The gate, which is the entrance to the way, is the new birth experience. Jesus said in John chapter 3 and verse 5, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter. That's the gate, the kingdom of God. To further emphasize the narrowness of the gate, Jesus reiterated, marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. The entrance indeed is narrow. Matthew 19 records an incident where a young man came to Jesus and asked what he must do to inherit eternal life. Jesus first said, keep the commandments. The young man wanted clarification. He said, which? And Jesus began to list what we would know commonly as the Ten Commandments. This man claimed he had kept all of these commandments from the time that he was a child. And then he asked, what yet do I lack? Jesus said to this man, if you will be perfect, go and sell what you have and give to the poor and follow me. The Bible says that that young man who had much wealth left sorrowfully. Jesus turned to his disciples and he said this, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The eye of the needle was a narrow gate. It was a short gate that a camel who would be loaded down with burdens that people had put upon its back. It was impossible for a camel to get through the gate. Now the lesson here was not that the rich man cannot be saved, but Jesus said, with God all things are possible. But the lesson is, this gate is really narrow. One doesn't enter the kingdom of God on a whim. It's a choice you must make. You must determine 
to enter this way, to enter the kingdom of God. The Bible says every man presseth into it. That shows a picture of me, uh, to me, of squeezing through the gate and ducking down into this gate that is called the eye of a needle. That's just a small gate, not intended for the masses, not intended for the crowds, not intended for a large number of people. It's just those who seek it out and press in are able to enter the narrow gate. Now, the broad gate is easy to find and easy to enter. It requires no commitment, no sacrifice, no decisions. Just go with the flow and you go through the gate. The, the path of the two ways are as contrasting as the gates themselves because on the other side of the broad gate is a broad way, which itself seems careless and effortless. One can just go and allow the works of their flesh to run loose. Any kind of sin, no discipline in their life, do whatever I want to do. That's the way of the Broadway, or is it? What is it that you really want? What about the end? Where is this all leading to? Proverbs 14 and verse 12 says, there's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And we kind of get in this mentality and in humanity that if everyone else is doing it, it must be okay. It must be the right. So we do it because everybody else is doing it. But that's not true about the kingdom of God. That's not true about your salvation. That's not true about your lifestyle if you consider the end. Don't misunderstand me. There are the consequences of sin are not only paid for at judgment. The Bible says in Proverbs 13 and 25 that the way of the transgressor is hard. There is a weight and burden of sin that gets heavier and heavier as we walk longer and longer on the broad way. What started out easy ends up very, very difficult. Sin robs its participants of their peace and joy. But the narrow way, that little narrow gate that you have to squeeze and press into, that narrow gate that few will find and few will enter, that narrow gate on the other side is a narrow path. It is a narrow way that is so narrow and so awkward that it must be traveled very carefully. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5 from the New English Translation says, be very careful how you live. And it's talking about the narrow way. Not as unwise, but as wise. For this reason, do not be foolish, but be wise by understanding what the will of the Lord is. But don't you for a minute believe that all the benefits of walking the narrow way is the crown of life at the end. No, no, no. Jesus begins this Sermon on the Mount, the same sermon where he speaks of the two ways, which was commonly, uh, he begins that with what was commonly called the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes describe how those who are blessed are walking in the narrow way. You see, there's, it's not only in what is to come, but the psalmist said every day God loads him with benefit. And when you are on the narrow way, you are truly blessed. Sometimes it's difficult. You have to pay careful attention to every step. You have to will it. You have to commit yourself to it. You have to press into it. You have to duck. You have to watch out for not tripping or for wandering from the path. Yes, with great carefulness and wisdom, you must traverse this lightly traveled way. But if you do, you'll be blessed. And so Jesus begins this Sermon on the Mount with blessed is the man, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, 
for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled or satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And then this is odd, because it says, Blessed are they which are persecuted, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. And blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil things about you falsely on account of me. And he said, rejoice and be glad because your reward is great in heaven. I want you to know today that to be truly blessed in life doesn't mean everything is smooth and that the trail is easy and that everything, some call it a, a, a bed of roses, a life of luxury and ease, in a Christian life, no, no, no. There are persecutions, there are insults, there are troubles, there are trials, and yet we are blessed. Because blessed is not the state of the present, but being blessed is knowing the future. It is knowing the end. It's knowing that after you enter that narrow gate and you walk that narrow way, that the end is life. It is life. Or the, net, or the Broadway leads to destruction. There is bumps in this road. And there are days where we totally rely on God to make it. There are times of persecution and insults. But every single day on the narrow way is a day of blessing. And then, finally, there's the crown. I'm in this. For the crown. Paul was in this. For the crown. Paul wrote to Timothy. I charge thee. Because there is. Before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Who shall judge the quick and the dead. At his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word he was saying. Conduct yourself with this in mind. That the end is coming. And there will be a judgment. And God will judge us. For the deeds that are done in the body. But I'm in it for a crown. When you press through the narrow gate. By being born of water and of the spirit. I want you to know that's intentional. That's not an easy believism. It's not just accepting the Lord. It's obeying the gospel. And following God's plan. Peter said it this way. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's not just easy believism, but there is a pathway to follow. There is an entrance to go in and to enter. I'm in this for the crown and you must be in for it for the crown. If you're not, you will fail and you will stumble. You will not be able to see against oh, beyond your present circumstances. So be in this for the crown. Because the end is where the weeds and the tares are separated. Where the goats and the sheep are put on the right hand and on the left. Where the good fish are taken out of the net. And the bad fish are cast away. It's no wonder the apostle Peter said in his first epistle. What shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And he follows that up in verse 18 of chapter 4. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? In other words, if the righteous are doing everything they can to be saved and they just barely make it, what would be the state of the sinner? The one who does not try. The one who makes no life change. Who does not repent. Who does not live. A holy righteous life in this world. What would be the end? At the end of his journey. The apostle Paul said finally. Finally. There is a crown. Of righteousness laid up for me. But I like this. He followed that up with. But not for me only. The crown Paul was alluding to. Was a victor's crown. His fight and his course that was finished was correlated uh, uh, with uh, the narrow path 
and that also with the games which were so prevalent in the Roman Empire of his day. The crown of the victor in the Roman games where it was an olive branch placed gingerly upon the head of the victor. That olive branch would soon wither. It was only a temporary, short-living sign of the achievement of victory among the victor of the games. But that was not the crown. That was not the crown the apostle was seeing. To the Corinthian church, he wrote about the crown that he was seeing. In 1 Corinthians 9, alluding to the same race and fight that he talked about to Timothy, he said, do you not know that all the runners in the stadium compete, but only one receives the prize? So run to win. Each competitor must exercise self-control in everything. They do it to receive a perishable crown, but we an imperishable crown. So Timothy Paul wrote, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. So as Paul instructed Timothy to live with the end in mind, today I remind you, there is a crown. So run that you may obtain.